Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'll call this meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. by recognizing the traditional keepers of this land, specifically our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the municipality of Brighton is located on the Mississauga Anishinaabek territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga. The Council of the Municipality of Brighton respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga Nation are the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. I will also advise that due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, this meeting will be held using various formats. Members of Council and some municipal staff are present here in the Council Chambers. Other staff members and our delegation are joining us via electronic conference technology. The public is invited to join us by viewing this meeting live on the Municipality of Brighton YouTube channel. I will also note that once we proceed into the closed session, the live YouTube stream will end for the duration of tonight's council meeting. With that, we move to the approval of the agenda, moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Councilor LeBlanc, that Council approve the October 18th, 2021 Council agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? And if so, please state the general nature thereof. There are none noted. Are there any announcements this evening? Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm pretty excited. I received something in the mail that you all you all should be pretty envious of. Uh, I got my slow your roll certificate today from the county. This is uh, my pledge to the community to, for uh, public road safety. Uh, I know we'll be talking about it tonight at one of our agenda items, but it has nothing to do with that. Um, so this is something that you may have seen and there's actually a billboard out in front of the school uh, facing King Edward Park. Uh, you may have seen it. And uh, I posted this this afternoon. <laughs> it's amazing the number of people that are dying to, to get one of these stickers for their vehicle. So it's an awareness thing. I, I, when I saw it, I thought it was a little silly, but it's not silly. It's something that we can all think about rolling through uh, stop signs and speed and all those things. So anyway, if people are interested, jump on board and stick it on your car and drive properly. <laughs> anyhow, thank you. You're welcome. And you can make the pledge uh, by visiting the Northumberland County website and uh, just search slow your roll. And if you make the pledge, uh, they'll send you a sticker for your car. Yeah. And please don't get pulled over while uh, while having one of those stickers on your car. I don't want to have. <laughs> I don't want to have to do, explain it. Do indeed I slow your roll if you're going to wear one of those stickers. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements, Councillor LeBlanc? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to make an announcement for the YMCA. They just finished their sun fundraiser uh, for uh, Cal, who uh, climbed Mount Everest over uh, five thousand stories. You just finished that. You just finished it after uh, three and a half weeks of climbing, so which was good. Thanks. Thank you. And you Thank raised two thousand dollars. Thanks, Councilor Bateman. Uh, just uh, three reminders. Uh, there's a vaccination clinic October twenty third at the Keeler Center in Colburn at the arena. It's uh, running from eleven till two. We're going to have another one here at Codrington Fire Hall Station number two on the thirtieth of October from eleven to two. And the third reminder is on the same day, the Codrington Trunk and Treat from 4 to 6 p.m. in the field in Codrington. So if anybody wants to participate, go onto the Trunk and Treat website and contact Ashley. And if you want to have a car there to hand out, or if you just want to bring your kids in, it's all going to be COVID safety, as we've mentioned before, one entrance in, one entrance out. So four till six. Yeah. So anybody that wants to put a the vehicle in or if you want to come out i'm going to have one there handing out candy anybody's more than welcome to join go ahead this could probably be for you and i think you probably received some too during the course of the meeting tonight since we have uh, closed captioning on there i received two or three emails that they said that sometimes when they're watching at home lights aren't being pulled in front and they couldn't hear what we were saying so since we don't have the closed captioning yet <laughs> I, I received at least one of those emails as well, and I will be uh, endeavoring to monitor uh, microphone behavior during the meeting to make sure everyone can hear properly. But all members of council are present tonight, and it is a council meeting at the end of the day. So as long as 
the seven members of council are able to hear each other. That's um, that's really my my focus uh, for these meetings. It is a it is a council meeting for council business. Any other announcements this evening? That takes us to the adoption of the minutes with a motion moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that Council adopt the October 4th, 2021 Council meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. We have no statutory public meeting this evening. Bringing us to delegations and presentations, and we have uh, one delegation. This evening, delegates have 10 minutes to provide council with their information. It is noted that language, content, and conduct must remain respectful at all times. Council will provide, be provided with an opportunity to ask questions of clarification from the delegation representative based on the information that they have presented. Council is reminded that this is not an opportunity to engage in debate with the delegate nor advance a public policy position. Delegates are reminded that council does not make decisions during the delegation portion of the meeting. And our uh, first and only delegation is Wendy Warner, Chair, QHC Board, with a team update. Ms. Warner. Wendy, I, I, we see your presentation, so the screen share is working, but I think you may be muted. Hi there, uh, Mayor Ostrander, it's Stacy Dobb. Hi, uh, Stacy. It's actually me, not Wendy, who's giving the presentation, although uh, I am thrilled that Wendy has joined us today. So just a clarification, it's uh, Stacy Dobb. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, thank you very much. So I'll get started. And uh, I first wanna thank uh, the mayor and council uh, for having uh, the delegation, having us come and attend tonight. I really have a few objectives. Uh, my first one is just to have an opportunity to introduce myself uh, to council. Um, I joined uh, Quinty Healthcare in January and uh, feel very strongly it's my responsibility to get out uh, and meet our local uh, municipal politicians uh, and keep them apprised of uh, important developments uh, and ongoings uh, with one of their, ho one of their uh, hospitals. I want to acknowledge that Nancy Evans, my board chair, has also joined us virtually tonight. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, uh, Wendy, uh, being a formidable partner of Quinty Healthcare is also in attendance. So uh, I've been with uh, Quinty Healthcare now for nine months. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's been uh, quite a, a strange entry into a community to come in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, but that strange entry uh, into the world of uh, healthcare in a local hospital has really been balanced off by uh, the warm welcome I have received from all of the community and all of our municipal partners. Um, Quinty Healthcare is uh, one of the hospitals that serves your communities and um, I wanna provide a bit of an update. Uh, and then I have a, a very, some very, I think easy asks at the end of my presentation. So I wanna start a little bit about uh, talking about what uh, the last 18 months has been like uh, for your local healthcare heroes. Um, and our optimism uh, about the path forward. Um, at Quinty Healthcare and all the hospitals in the region, uh, we have adapted uh, and stayed nimble through four successive waves of the pandemic. And uh, while I am entirely proud uh, of our healthcare heroes and what they have achieved uh, during this time, it certainly has come at a cost. Uh, they are tired, uh, they are exhausted, uh, and as you'll hear later, uh, we are, as an organization, uh, and all many health organizations in Ontario, uh, really being faced uh, with a health human resource shortage um, that, that I, in my professional career, have never experienced. We are very optimistic about the fourth wave um, uh, in that, uh, given the vaccination rates, I heard you talking about your, vaccine, your local vaccination clinics, uh, and the uh, work to get our uh, communities vaccinated. Uh, the fourth wave has been very different from the third wave uh, for Quinty Healthcare. Uh, during the third wave, we had quite high numbers uh, of COVID patients, both in our inpatient unit, our emergency departments, our inpatient units, uh, as well as uh, in our ICUs. And both the vaccination uh, work, as well as the continued public health measures have really seen a different fourth wave for us. And uh, oftentimes uh, people will ask me the question that, you know, the numbers are so much better, uh, you know, does that mean that we really should back right off uh, of all of these public health measures? And you, you really only need to look 
uh, both west and, and to some degree east in Ontario to see that uh, these vaccination uh, rates uh, as well as continued public health measures obviously mitigated over time are exceptionally important to keeping the COVID numbers and admissions to our local hospitals low. Um, at the same time, uh, uh, as uh, we have moved into the fourth wave, we've also seen a very un unprecedented level of activity uh, at the hospital. And I think uh, if my colleague uh, from Northumberland was here, they would say the same thing. When, when uh, we started to open up the province in uh, the summer, uh, what we saw was uh, a very rapid increase in the number of people that are coming to emergency departments and hospitals either because uh, perhaps they had delayed care or had felt not safe coming out. So uh, we're feeling quite a significant uh, increase in the numbers of patients that are uh, coming in need of our care. The, one of the small requests I have is that uh, it is essential that we continue to support uh, the people who are caring for our community, the healthcare heroes across. And I know that there has been waves uh, by municipalities and others and communities to support them, uh, but our work is not over. My second uh, um, uh, kind of observation, uh, having worked in several different regions uh, in the province, uh, primary care, as many of you know, is essential uh, to a healthcare system and really acts as the foundation. Uh, and without that foundation or piece being in play, uh, people often have difficulty uh, seeking care, whether it's a young family or, or older adults. I know uh, Council has been uh, supportive of Docs by the Bay and has really worked hard for us to be able to recruit new positions to the, to the area. Uh, and it's critical that uh, we continue to do that. Uh, for every 100 babies that, is, that, is born, that are born at Quinty Healthcare, uh, 20 of those babies do not have a doctor and their mother or a family physician, uh, making it very challenging for them to get uh, regular care. So the municipalities work with us to think about how we strengthen uh, our local primary care systems uh, is essential. Last, just talking about the power of partnership. Uh, so we are very blessed to have many partners uh, in our community, uh, including our foundation who is here today, uh, many of our Ontario health team partners that we're starting to work differently with. Uh, but I really see a, a considerable opportunity working with our municipalities I do not see myself as a typical uh, hospital CEO. I am interested in more than the hospital. I'm interested in the health and wellness of our communities. And the only way to advance that is to do that in partnership with our municipalities. That, that's not necessarily looking for the municipalities to give money to health. I know that's a, a quite a controversial issue, but it's really partnering to understand uh, uh, and um, understand our communities and work together in partnership uh, to advance programs uh, and different ways of servicing them. Quinty Healthcare, uh, I've been here nine months and uh, Quinty Healthcare has launched a strategic planning process. Uh, and we really are very interested in getting um, many voices uh, to the table in terms of co-designing the future of the hospitals. I believe strongly that these are the community's hospitals uh, and they need to have a voice in the future. Over the last number of weeks, we've been out to all of the communities we've served, uh, meeting with service clubs, residents. Uh, we met with uh, the municipal leaders last Friday to talk about how, uh, how Quinty Healthcare uh, can be a better partner, a better hospital. Uh, and uh, I'm really hoping uh, that council will help us in getting uh, our survey out to your residents. Um, it's been shared across many municipalities, and if council members themselves could uh, participate in the survey and provide input into Quinty's healthcare uh, strategic plan going forward. Um, so just in uh, closing, I, I have a few asks. So one is um, for us to continue to build on our partnership over time, both to strengthen uh, primary care in our region, uh, but also population health and wellness. Uh, and looking for new ways for hospitals and municipalities to work together. Uh, on our OHT right now, we have municipal partners at the table, and I can tell you uh, they bring such a different lens uh, and such a different contribution to the discussions we're having uh, about the health and wellness of our community. Uh, your continued uh, and generous support for both our capital campaigns, uh, as well uh, as uh, Docs uh, by the Bay and other uh, uh, opportunities uh, to really think about investments that, that pay big, big rewards. Um, I believe very uh, 
strongly that strong hospitals uh, uh, equal strong communities and uh, just wanted an opportunity to uh, address council, introduce myself uh, and uh, ask for your participation in our, in our strategic plan and, uh, and our partnership going forward. And with that, I will pass it back to Mayor Ostrander. Well, thank you, President Dobb. We appreciate your remarks and your information. I'll turn the floor over to members of council if they have any questions of clarification. Council? I don't see any. So again, uh, we thank you for your presentation and I will read the motion before me, which is moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The council received the presentation from Stacy Dobb, President and CEO of QHC. I think we can end it there. Right? So I've, I've changed that, uh, that motion to uh, accurately reflect the presentation and who was presenting. Are you okay with that, Councillor LeBlanc? You okay with that, Councillor Rowley? Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I see on the last page of the presentation, um, the um, Survey Monkey link. I was wondering if um, we would add that uh, to our municipal website for maybe our residents to uh, maybe share in uh, sending their thoughts along as well. And President Dobb, would that be something you'd like us to do? That would be wonderful and much appreciated. We really wanna hear from all the residents and uh, patients that we serve. Uh, Madam Clerk, CAO, do you require direction through motion? You're good, okay. So that will happen over the course of the next couple of days. Thank you very much, I really appreciate it. And it was nice to meet you all. Thank you for the suggestions. Any other questions or comments with regard to the motion? All those in favor? There being none opposed, the motion's carried. Madam President, Madam Chair, Ms. Warner, thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate uh, your attendance. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, Deputy Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining us for Citizens Con? Thank you. That brings us to staff reports. Our first report is with regard to closed captioning. Mr. Street, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? Not at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The council received the closed captioning report from the clerk's office for budget consideration. And further, the council support the recommendation from staff to utilize a human pre-recorded captioning service for live stream council and committee meetings. Is there any discussion? Deputy Mayor. Um, actually, uh, I believe this came, this request came through the accessibility committee originally. Um, I'd like to hear what our, our count, two counselors on that committee think, whether uh, what the right route to go and what the, what the uh, general nature is uh, of what they're wanting, I guess. Is this going to cover it or one of these options is going to cover it? Councillor Tadman, Councillor Bateman. Yes, it, it, we try, I think there was one time when we tried and, and that particular whatever system wasn't working well, didn't work well at all. But our deputy clerk has um, done a lot of um, looking into different services. And, uh, you know, we want to be accessible to all people. So uh, I think uh, even if it's one person who finds this very valuable, and I know myself personally, uh, I know people in this community that, that have a real hearing impairment, but would enjoy being able to want to, to read, read it on screen. So uh, that's why I definitely would support this. Thank you for that, Councilor Bateman. The only thing I'll add is well, we talked about it at the last meeting and I, I think the clerk's office looked at the numbers. It's not just about real time when people are watching it, it's when they go back and look at it later. So the numbers might be misleading for anybody that says, oh, you've only got four or five, maybe six people looking at it. At the end of the month, two months, six months from now, that number could quadruple or whatever. My only question is once it's transcribed uh, to the deputy clerk, it stays there forever, correct? It's not something that we pay for and out of free meeting to describe it, it's gone or? Through the mayor? Uh, that's that's correct. Uh, yeah, it uh, it can be embedded in the actual video, or it can still be controlled by the individual watchers. But it's always a part of that video. 
Thank you. Go ahead. The only thing I'll add is the, the best way of looking at this for me, my analogy is it's kind of like the way people view television nowadays. At one time you watched your favorite show when it came on or you missed it forever. And most of the people in this room and probably in the community watch their show on their terms when they're available. And that's what this is about. Not everybody can meet when our committees meet at the various times, but they will go back in time and see them at. So. Thank you for that. Any, did that answer your question, Deputy Mayor? Do you have anything for follow-up? Thank you. Any other questions or comments, Councilor Tadman? And I think the other thing is sometimes uh, when you have um, a disability, sometimes you like to review something the second time. So it's always good that you can go back. And I think as more people realize that we, we are offering this, there'll be more people that will be interested in using it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I also know there's a there's a certain generation, a certain demographic, the younger uh, folks use closed captioning just to ensure they don't miss anything when they're watching it. Um, my younger daughter, especially, has always has, and she's her hearing's fine, but she always has the the closed captioning on when she's watching uh, shows. Uh, I don't know whether that will carry forward as she gets into the working world and and has conducts meetings this way, but I, I do find it um, quite frankly bizarre. But <laughs> I, I think it's just the way they they engage with media. Go ahead, Councilor. You may find it bizarre, but I find it kind of comforting <laughs> to be able to, to that way. I get the, the things that I don't quite hear. I, yeah. I can read it. Yeah. So no, I, it's, and it's just who knows? She may have a bit of of a problem hearing some things or or digesting things. You yeah, never know. Yeah, it could be a, a cognitive thing. Who knows? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Anyone else? Deputy Mayor. I was just going to comment that as much as this is a, there's a cost involved as is everything that we do, um, we are to remain accessible. So it's something we actually need to do. Um, so uh, I'm certainly willing to go ahead with the uh, recommendation. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Uh, we did receive an email, <clears throat> all members of council and uh, Mr. Street and Mr. Castleman from a, a citizen uh, uh, early, I think it was early on Friday morning. Um, and I won't read the whole uh, email, um, but Mr. Street or Mr. Castleman, did you reply to this email by chance? Thank you, Mr. Street. Okay, so just uh, there were a couple of questions, and I want to make sure we're addressing those questions for the for the citizen. Um, one of them was how many inquiries have we received from citizens um, about adding this kind of thing to the meetings? I, I'm not sure how many, but this is a recommendation that came from one of our advisory committees. So that's really why we're moving forward with this. And the other one was, um, um, have we compared what other municipalities are doing uh, in this regard? Mr. Street, do you have an answer for that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's actually a legislated um, requirement that we need to provide uh, closed captioning as part of the uh, AODA uh, communications um, and information standard. Um, so all municipalities are are going through some form of trying to figure out how they can uh, be in compliance with that regulation. Thank you for that. And of course, the pandemic has forced us all into these uh, kind of meetings. So no doubt everybody will be tackling this issue. Thank you. Appreciate that. And any further, Council Rowley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Is this um, program going to begin now or are we looking at this for 2022? Just, uh, for I know what we talked about budget here, but I'm just wondering, are we going to start uh, sooner than later or are we waiting until the budget time? This says for budget consideration, Mr. Street. Yeah, Mr. Street's, we're, we'll be waiting through budget. Yeah, yeah. Councilor Tadman. I, I'm, I'm almost positive at your church, there's special devices there for those that can sit in the same as ours. And I think we're more aware that we have to provide for, because there's, I, I, I know of a little, guy that's only five years old that can only hear with really strong hearing aids so um we're not just talking about us old guys that finally lose some hearing it's it it starts from a young age through so i think uh, i think that we we really need to uh, help as much as we can in that area thank you i agree council bateman uh, just one quick comment just to i agree with the deputy mayor's every decision we make there's a cost to it and 
I saw the questions as well. And the only thing I'd say on that, they're all valid questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question, but, and as the deputy clerk indicated, it's legislated requirement. And I like the fact that our accessibility chair and we have our clerk that's on there that's very knowledgeable. I, I love the fact that our municipality is gonna be leaders in this. We often get those memorandums from other municipalities that say, do you support this? It's kind of nice that we're a small municipality like Brighton is taking the lead and is out in front you know, so now they can look at us and say, hey, they're doing it. Like, we don't always have to be followers. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Takes us to our next report, alternative voting method, 2022 municipal election. Mr. Street, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? I just wanted to make a note that the uh, president of Simply Voting uh, Brian Lack is in attendance uh, virtually. If we have any questions that may relate to the, the organization that will be doing this if we go down this road, thank you. So I have a motion moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Deputy Mayor Connect, that Council receive the alternative voting method report from the clerk's office for information and that Council adopt a bylaw to authorize the use of internet voting as an alternative method of voting for the 2022 municipal and school board elections. Is there any discussion? Council Rowley. Uh, yeah, so the same thing. Does this mean we are just having internet voting and we are not having mail in voting or that's, like vote that's, by mail? This that's is just my understanding. totally internet voting. Yeah, uh, Deputy Clerk? Yes, that's the intention of the report. Deputy Mayor? I, I believe we voted on that last year. Um, I still have some reservations too. I mean, my parents don't have Wi-Fi. They will have to come here in order to vote. We talked about having kiosks in the foyer, which is great. And I think it would be great if we have some other locations, but people still have to get here to do that. I just wanna make sure we talk about accessibility. I just wanna make sure that we're not actually doing the opposite here um, before we move forward with that. So I guess I just need to hear a little bit more about it. And I am curious to know whether we can still have some sort of paper ballot. I don't know the answer to that. I wanna make sure we discuss this thoroughly before we move on and do something that we might so regret later. Two, two questions here, accessibility. We wanna make sure that everyone has access to be able to vote, be it from home, which of course would be the easiest way this way, but more importantly for those who have um, technological concerns or may not be able to access the internet, that we are making it accessible for them to come here and that we're seeking other opportunities to go elsewhere as well. So Madam Clerk, Deputy Clerk. Yes, so um, we're gonna make it available for 10 days prior to the election, um, a kiosk down here in the library. Um, and then also possibly out at the Codrington Center too, as long as we can get into the library there and use the, the internet there. Um, that's what another option for us to do. Um, we were opening it up so that people can come in and do the voting. That's what we heard a lot of while we were even doing the mail-in ballots. I, ha I had a lot of people that were very upset about doing mail-in ballots because they wanted to come in and be able to do it themselves. This way they can come in and they can do it themselves. It's just on, by electronic means instead of paper. Um, in my last report that I had sent to council, I showed the cost differences between paper ballots um, vote by mail and um, the electronic. So it is the cheapest method is the electronic way, the internet voting. Um, and I just thought that with us opening up to everybody to be able to come in and do their own voting, I thought that that was the best option. And the other question was around? Accessibility. No, that was the first one. You just answered that one. Me neither. No, we got that. Okay, I'll move on and maybe we'll come back to that. Councillor Rowley. Thank you. Um, did you take into consideration, I, I see there is a, a cost difference for sure, but you will have to have now extra staffing or extra paid people to kind of man the kiosks, won't you? You need, people will need to have, folks will need to have help to, to, to get through that process. I would, I would think we just can't have you know, with the mail in, you just dump it in the box, right? Now you're gonna to have to have people kind of guide you through the process. Madam Clerk. No, actually we had more 
staffing with the vote by mail for the day of the voting. And we had two extra people. We had an election assistant as well um, for vote by mail. Uh, we had to have people opening up the ballot, separating them. So the, the privacy secrecy envelope went into a box and then they weren't opened until that night, but when we had to strike people off the list, this way we don't have to do this. This will, um, there's gonna be maybe one person or two persons at this kiosk down here, and then one maybe out at the Codrington, but we can utilize our own staff from the clerk's department for that, and maybe one election assistant and that's it. So we will still be um, saving money. Um, we won't be having as many people involved. Councilor Tadman. So I, we have done mail, in, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've done this for, for since an amalgamation. Yes. I think you're right. And I haven't seen any great problems. I haven't, uh, you know, the odd personal complaint, no matter what we do here. Uh, and there is people that do have problems going on the internet and, and doing this kind of thing. And I think uh, I'm just not ready to move to this, it's, it's like the old saying, if, if it isn't broken, why change it and do something else? Uh, we have put money away each year towards this. And uh, I, I think it's well worth sticking with what we know at this point. So I, I will, will not support this. Thank you for that. Councillor LeBlanc. When this first came up, I looked at the uh, mayor, I'm sorry. And for not acknowledging you, I apologize for that. The, um, the thing is, when I looked at this, the internet, I thought everybody was good on it, going with it and everything. But then I didn't do staff jobs. I did my job as a counselor. So when this came up, I started asking the odd thing. And as it, I saw it was in the election, it was on the motion tonight. I asked more people. And, and I went to a few places and asked where they can't travel. They don't have access to internet. If they don't have a mail it ballot, they're not going to vote. Uh, somehow, I guess it's something that posted on Facebook today or yesterday about this. And I was in the grocery store today and I got hit on three times. They said, if we don't have a, if I don't have a mail in ballot, I'm not voting council. So, and so I, I looked at this and a lot of the uh, people in says you're 95% of the seniors would like it. Those were the ones that probably use the internet. The 95% that I met, which is really 100%, they all said they wouldn't vote if they don't have a ballot. So this is, this is where it is, and that's probably 40 people that have voted every election. So this is where it comes that we get loaded for represent, we're here to represent the residents, all the residents, just not a few that are techie or on both sides. We're working on broadband to get this. So I have to go and I voted to go with the electrical, but after I talked with the residents and the ones that communicated to me, they all want a mail-in ballot. So this is where I am. I got to go with a mail-in ballot. So, because I haven't seen the ones that I've sent that have said computer to me yet. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Bateman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just one comment, one question. Uh, the comment first, the one thing we'd have to keep in mind and God forbid we're at this position next October, but that depending on where we are in the pandemic, there will be an extra added layer. If we're still in any kind of phase where we have to sanitize, you'd have to, so that will bring in extra people, but hopefully that doesn't come into play. My question is around, uh, we talked about this is the most cost efficient method. Do we have any analysis on which is the most accurate method? Deputy Clerk? Um, I would maybe defer that question to uh, Brian Lack if, if he's uh, available to answer that. Mr. Lack? Uh, yes. Uh, well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, in, in my obviously, uh, I'm the president of Simply Voting. We are a vendor of in internet voting, so uh, I guess that puts me at a bit of a bias. But I would, I would, I would submit that internet voting is the most accurate compared to uh, in-person voting or mail-in ballots because the votes are captured by a computer and are counted by the computer. So there's no room for human error. Unless that error is made by the person voting, in which case it's their error, <laughs> right? 
Exactly. Or if there was a, a, a bug in the software, but we, we run, every day we're running about 200 elections and we have a very rigorous software development process uh, where everything is double, triple tested. Thank you, Mr. Lack. Thank you. Councillor Councilor Anderson. Thank you. Uh, some good discussion here. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I hear certain things that I would like to say too. I think uh, the paper ballot is uh, something that's got to stay for a while yet uh, until we get to everything. And, uh, and uh, Councillor LeBlanc talked about improving the internet. Uh, all, there's all kinds of factors. And uh, I'm not convinced the internet would be the uh, most accurate. Uh, we don't know who's inputting because it's garbage in, garbage out. Uh, that's a term. But we don't, you don't know necessarily who's making that, doing that vote. I don't know how you do that. Um, the other thing is, uh, I'm not in favor. It was discussed also uh, about phone using phones to uh, vote. Uh, I'm not for that one bit. So, I think that what I'd be in favor of is the ballot, the, the, the ballot form, as uh, in the past. And I think we can have two methods, right? Or is, am I correct on Madam that? Madam Clerk, I think that's entirely up to council. Yeah, so we can have two methods. Um, so you could be paper and um, something else, but I'm not in favor of the internet this year. Council Bateman. Is it okay to ask Mr. You may. Yeah. Uh, just on the internet voting. So somebody, uh, I won't say there, let's say it's voting for school board trustee, but that way nobody throws things at me in here. <laughs> so somebody wants to vote for John Doe and they actually click on Jane Doe that doesn't record that until they hit the submit button, correct? They can back out of that if they, you know, hit the wrong button in their mind and, or once they click it, it's not, I guess the question is, it's not a vote until they hit the submit on each, because there'll be multiple categories, right? Because we do, this will be capturing the school board races as well. That's mm -hmm. why. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Mr. Lack. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, we have a composite ballot. It's as if, all the questions and all the races were on one piece of paper. So you fill out the form on your computer from top to bottom, and then you get to the submit button uh, or the continue button, I should say, because then there's a confirmation screen where it reiterates, it, it's, it spits right back to you, your selections in bold, very clear. For mayor, I voted for this person. For councillors at large, I voted for these people. And for the school board, I voted for that person. And you have to double check and get and 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 scan it get to the bottom in order to do the final submission of your ballot or if you catch a mistake you could click correct and change your mind go ahead no that, that was going to be my follow-up question i was just going to ask because a lot of the websites you go to have that review screen before you hit submit so that you can and, and i think most people here have downloaded their vaccination confirmations and it does the same thing where you review everything you've put in before but that's why i'm going to thank you for that Thank you. Anyone else? Deputy Mayor. Uh, just for clarity, we're not deciding on whether or not we're doing paper. We decided that last year already. Uh, so I'm just curious to know if, if this doesn't go through, what, um, this gets voted down, what happens? Because we decided on something already a year ago. Madam Clerk. Yeah, so council already um, picked the method that they wanted to go with, like you said, by resolution. Um, this, what I was, what we were presenting was that we were going with simply voting for the internet. Um, we were passing a bylaw for that um, without telephone because we had picked internet with telephone and we wanted to show the, the reasons why we don't uh, want to go with telephone um, for the security reasons for that and for complications that it does um, arise from, from the telephone uh, categories. So that's what this, was, this report was coming back for. It wasn't coming back for council to change their mind on their alternative method that they had already picked. It was to, um, just to let you know that the tele why telephone isn't um, an option that we would like you to go with, with the internet part. And that's why we have this gentleman here was to explain the reasons why we wouldn't suggest to do that. But we did pass, you did pass a resolution already to go with internet. Deputy Mayor, as a follow up. Uh, yeah, so uh, we did choose two methods last year, and I think that's why we're having the issues today. And so I'm going to ask the question, can we have internet 
and um, mail-in ballots. That's right. Madam Clerk. Um, we can we can come back to council and explore how we would how we would do that because it'll be two different processes because we will have um, the internet with their tabulations and then we will have to have tabulations and then we will have to hire um, staffing to do that again. Also with um, the, the vote by mail, then we will have to get the, the type of equipment that the library has to make sure that um, the ballots are all cleaned and then they'll be opened and then they'll have to be cleaned. Um, so there will be an added cost for that. There will be more um, staffing to be able to do that method as well. Councilor Rowley. How much, have, how much, how much is in the budget for voting for next year for, for elections? Madam Clerk. Um, I can't remember exactly. We've been putting money into the reserves every year for elections. Um, I believe we, we have at least 40,000 in there, I believe, yeah. Anything further from members of council? This motion is moved by Councilor LeBlanc and seconded by Deputy Mayor Connect. Are we still comfortable with that, Councilor LeBlanc? You spoke against the motion, that's why I ask. Yes. I would like to change the motion. The Deputy Mayor, the seconder wants to go with it. And I'd like to go with her recommendation where no, no. All right. All right. Uh, in her question, she asked if we could look at the internet and ballot or just ballot. That's what I would like to change. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm going to suggest that we, if that's the route you want to go, we should just defeat this motion and put a different motion on the floor directing staff to prepare a report. For our for our information, that's okay. that's okay. I think how I think that's cleaner than trying to chop this one up, uh, Cl Madam Clerk. Um, we have gone out for RFP from the motion that we had from Council. That's why this gentleman's here. He he has been awarded the RFP for internet voting. So I'm not sure how this all falls in. It'll have some we'll have some um some work to do. Well, we'll we'll see where the the vote goes, and uh, part of your report will be to include that information for us. If in fact this is if this is defeated, I'm not frankly convinced it will be. So we'll see where it, what what happens here. Uh, go ahead. I'd like to call for recording. Vote. Very well. Any further discussion before we before I call the vote, Councilor right. Tadman? It's been so long since I heard the motion. Could you repeat? I'll read. It, I'll read it again <laughs> before I pass it on to the clerk. Any further discussion? So it's moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Deputy Mayor Connect, that Council receive the alternative voting method report from the clerk's office for information, and that Council adopt a bylaw to authorize the use of internet voting as an alternative method of voting for the 2022 municipal and school board elections. Madam Clerk, a recorded vote has been requested by Council LeBlanc. Go ahead before she reads it, yeah. Thank you. I would like to ask, uh maybe the deputy clerk, because he's probably the one who's put a lot of work into this, uh, as well as Candace. Um, you've listed a lot of municipalities here. Were you able to get in touch with any of them and see what their success rate in all of this was? Madam Clerk, Deputy Clerk. Um, I, I can just speak directly to uh, the municipality that I live in that you utilize uh, simply voting for the last election uh, entirely. Um, and the ease with which it, it uh, ran and, and a lot of positive feedback in that municipality. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Yep. And it was all good, like positive. Yeah. Good, um, good positive feedback. Everybody liked it. Um, the only drawback was the telephone. 
there was a lot of hiccups with the telephone voting. So that um, that's one of the reasons why most municipalities are dropping the telephone. Okay. So, but you said as far as like positive feedback, is that positive feedback from staff across the county? Or is it also positive feedback from residents across the county? Well, positive feedback from residents um, in um, uh, the Peterborough County, they all did um, surveys. They had surveys that were put out after the election and they got a very good positive feedback. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilor Tadman. Way back when, about at least a half hour ago, we talked about um, having a chaos in the municipal building. Is that still part? That is part of this report. So before I cast a vote, I want to be assured that how that's going to work. So then those who do the, do the people that absolutely do not know how to use computer to vote or are, you know, for whatever reason can't do it, um, do they have to phone in for a ballot? or can they come in and, and receive a ballot and vote then? So That's every, the only everyone will still receive the, the voting information by mail. Okay. And then those who don't want to or can't access the internet can come to the municipal hall and there'll be an election helper in, in the municipal hall and or at Codrington Hall to aid them in their voting procedure without telling them how to vote, but telling them oh, the method by which. So uh, that the paper that's going to go out to every taxpayer will give all that information. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, and just further to that, I just want to make sure um, we talked about a kiosk here. Uh, this is new, so I think we need to be very careful about how we go about it. I, I see the benefit of it. I see that it would be more accurate and actually um, for many it's easier, not for everybody, but for many it is easier. And we talked about Codrington and I would like to see even um, just a, we don't have to put it in the motion, but maybe there may be a few other locations because it's new that we could do this at like maybe other, anyway, you know what I'm saying. So that we have other locations available for people who need to come in and need a little bit of help the first time to go and do that. And, and I would be willing to give it a try if, if we're um, confident that, that we can help people, really. We, we want everyone to be able to vote. That's, that's the only reason why there's any kind of discussion tonight. Councillor Tadman. Thanks once again. And, and as uh, Deputy Mayor was speaking, there, there is people uh, such as in the nursing home that we always set up a, a booth for. So will that happen? And also there, you know, a great deal of the people at Applefest and uh, Golden Plow, not Golden Plow, um, Golden, Golden Pond. Pond. Yeah. Those people, will we be offering that service? Because we should. Madam Clerk. Yeah, we will be going out to those locations. Um, we will we'll contact them like what we did before. Um, they had their staff uh, help their, their residents themselves. They didn't ask for us to come in, but we will give them the option um, for us to come out and help if, we, if they need us to. I know that like with COVID and everything that's going on, they may not want us to come in, um, but we will give them definitely that option. We will have um, a tool on our website too that will show you how to do it, step-by-step um, -step instructions. Um, and, they, and people can come and ask us um, when we have it set up down at the kiosk, or just if they wanna just have instructions on how to do it, we will have that available as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rowley. Thank you. I would, um, part of my concern was the same as Councillor Tadman as far as getting into the retirement residences as well. Um, two kiosks seems a bit limited. I think when, you know, our rural municipality, the rural area, it's quite, you know, I would think, could we put them in the schools? Like I'm thinking Smithfield or um, Spring Valley or something. Can we work with the schools to do something as we would have or churches as we would have before if we had um, kind of what we know as a normal election. <laughs> Probably the churches would be more accessible than, than the schools. schools. Schools aren't really wanting uh, other people in right now, but yeah, yeah. Most of them are locked up pretty tight, even pre-COVID, so. Uh, Councillor Anderson. Um, I feel more comfortable with it now. <laughs> but, uh, I, uh, after your comments too, I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, 
so there's a stipulated amount of time you have to use the internet, correct? Like a week or two or three. Um, what is the time? What is that time frame going to be? Madam Clerk, Deputy Clerk, do we know the answer yet to that? Uh, well, I think the original um, thought was 10 days prior to the election day. Um, but really, that is a procedure that can be determined at uh, any time in the next year. Yeah, as long as it's an appropriate amount of time and that, and is it right up to the eight o'clock or whatever type of a thing? It was, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, even, even when we did mail-in ballots, we would allow people to come into the municipal right up yeah. to the, the, the time and mm -hmm. past the time. If you were lined up by the time, yeah. you would be allowed to bring yeah. your ballot in okay. and well, have it open, which is why many of us waited around the community center for so long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Bateman. Uh, just a question around, uh, I'm not even sure how it worked for the mail-in vote, but let's say for somebody that is a property owner here or a business owner, but doesn't reside here or even snowbirds, did the mail-in ballots get sent to their address outside the community? And if so, how does that work? I'm not sure if the clerk's office or the gentleman on the screen can answer that. So anybody that's a snowbird or living in Toronto, Hamilton, wherever, will this system get that out to them in the same way as the mail-in ballots did? The, the, the answer is the, the, ballot, the ballot information will go to their permanent address, wherever that is. So if they're snowbirds, unless they've told the, the clerk, it'll, it won't go to them. But if they've told the clerk, then the clerk will be able to get it to them. Or if they forwarded their mail, it will get to them. Uh, through that through that system that same system i believe that there's a way that they can um uh pre-register as well online i know that um with data fix right they were able to go online see if they are on the system um for sure on the voters list and then uh they can change their their information at that point when they go on there right uh, through the mayor, yes, uh, they can request changes. Um, I don't know if we want to uh, ask for Brian's uh, uh, specific uh, procedure there. Mr. Lack? Uh, sure. Uh, well, this wouldn't be with simply voting. Uh, this would be with data fix. Uh, they do offer a voter registration portal feature and if these uh, if, if your municipality is subscribed to that feature then it allows voters to uh, uh, go online and uh, correct their own information uh, subject of course to staff approval um, so you have the physical address that gives every elector the right to vote based upon the physical location within the municipality of brighton but uh, there's also a mailing address which could be different so you could have an elector that has the letter with the voting instructions sent to a different address than the address that gives you the right to vote. Thank you for that. I'm just trying to understand this better because I've never used it before. So typically when you come into a polling station and with the when it's mailed out to the houses, I guess that's slightly different, but we'll focus on this one. How do you somebody gets that and i'm assuming there's a package and you can walk us through it that they have to register to do this so at the time they're doing it what mechanisms are in place to ensure voter verification like is there a specific id to that voter because if somebody went to john doe's house and picked up their mail can they register is it or is it information that only that household would know to allow them to to register them so like mr lack i think that's probably best Sure. Uh, so uh, the letter that gets sent out, uh, there's no need to register to receive the information needed to vote. This goes out to every single member of the electorate, a letter in a sealed envelope, security lined envelope, and the letter contains the address, the website to go to vote, as well as a pin. It's a, it's a numeric or, or alphanumeric random password, uh, quite a few characters long. And you need to type that into the website to log in to vote, as well as your date of birth. The date of birth is not present on the letter because you should know it already. <laughs> um, and uh, requiring the date of birth, as well as the PIN, uh, ensures that if a letter falls into the hands of a stranger, it's uh, very difficult for them to steal your vote. 
Go ahead. That was good information to have that they have to have the the birthday because that also ensures that you don't have somebody that's not of age to vote just doing it for somebody. How about uh, we talked about the cost and the accuracy. What was the uh, for all the different places that use this, how are they satisfied with the the accuracy of it? Like you said that, and you even said it yourself that you can speak volumes and high of your own thing, but of all the municipalities that used it, did you have any input coming back that it wasn't accurate? Like the voter fraud level, was, was there a percentage to that? And how is that compared to the other mechanisms that have been in play for decades? So like Sure. Uh, we've had uh, no complaints or negative feedback regarding accuracy at all. Uh, in terms of accessibility, uh, although this wasn't really asked, um, definitely we have a higher percentage of people voting by internet than by telephone. So if we look at all 28 municipalities that we worked with in 2018, 11% uh, of the votes came through telephone and the rest came through internet, whether people, mostly people voting from home, but also people voting from kiosks, a town hall, or other voter assistance centers. And uh, the, I guess the negative experience, if there, if there was one, would be telephone, in particular, municipalities that have count, uh, a counselor at large position with many, many candidates. Because if you're, if you're voting on the computer screen, your eyes could just scan the list and pick out the people you want to vote for. But to listen on the phone, you have to listen through all of them. So for example, in the city of St. Thomas, uh, you, or, or let's say the town of Ajax had a, a wards, a ward system. So there were only about two to seven candidates per ward. So you would have half a percent of the people that opened up an internet ballot wouldn't end up casting it. But it was two and a half percent of people that started a phone session that didn't make it all the way through casting their ballot. On the other hand, the city of St. Thomas had 19 candidates for councillors at large. People had to listen through all 19 and they had to select several. So they'd have to listen to names again and again. And you had over a 7% uh, dropout rate. So we don't uh, we're actually in the process of slowly phasing out offering telephone voting. We don't feel it's more accessible in terms of uh, people with visual impairments than internet voting. And uh, especially when you have many candidates, it's not the best experience for the voter. Uh, so we are no longer offering telephone voting this time around if it's a hybrid election with what paper, whether it's in person or, or mail in ballots. And our intention is in 2026 to not offer it at all and only offer internet by uh, remote and by kiosk. Thank you, sir. Councilor Gaiman has a follow up. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my more because I know the voters will want to know. And the reason I'm asking the question is not because I doubt the system, but the voters, especially in our municipality, because we've all said it, every one of us, that we are an aging municipality and that being what I mean by that is in terms of voting some people are really traditionalists and they've always voted one way there's some families that don't even tell their spouse how they vote so a change nobody likes change and this is a big change for people that voted a certain way so I'm just trying to ask questions that puts the community at ease when they're trying because there's probably some people in the community that have done this anybody that has migrated from a municipality that has used this system but there's many here that have never done it so I think they're gonna to wanna to be reassured that this system is gonna work. So my last question would be, what if, and we've all had it happen to us at home, we've had it happen to us in here, the internet freezes or the internet crashes and you're halfway through and you didn't hit the submit button and you reboot, do you start over again or when it reboots? So if, whether you're doing it at a kiosk or at home, will it reboot and you start at the start or will it reboot and pick up where you left off? So luck. Uh, it, you, you start from the start. Uh, it's a composite ballot, so it's one piece of paper. It's, the analog it's analogous to a single sheet of paper that you filled out all the boxes. Until you put that single piece of paper in the ballot box, you have not voted. So you would start from, uh, from the beginning. Councillor Rowley. Um, 
once again for the clerk's office, maybe or maybe for Brian. Um, what was the percentage rate? I'm thinking like, how, what was the percentage of different municipalities where residents were engaged? Like I know our percentage here uh, in 2018 was pretty high. I don't remember what, it, I don't exactly remember what it was, but did you see, would um, the other municipalities that you've um, been speaking with, do you know if their percentage rates of engaged residents was comparable? Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, I suggest you um, maybe prop it up with a book. Is that better? Yeah, okay. Hi, Tech. So the internet voting project found the following for voters, 95% of the voters were satisfied compared to satisfaction rate of 68% for paper voting methods. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to figure this out from my report before. Now I did notice, so the turnouts were higher for percentage for internet voting. Um, Clarington did uh, paper, traditional ballots. They had a 21% turnout. And um, I guess I believe it was over 50% in all other areas for the internet votings. Yeah, so the, it was a greater percentage that did vote. Um, and I know that um, we were one of the highest with our vote by mail. Yes, what last last term, right? Compared to any of the ones that we had done by vote by mail since amalgamation last, the last term um, election was the highest that we've done. Um, but I'm, I'm anticipating that we will probably have a better turnout with the internet voting as well. From all of the comments that we were receiving as staff when we were um, having people come in to get on the voters list and stuff, and then we had a lot of people saying it would be way easier if I could do this from home or I could do this on my phone. And um, these are people that work from out of, out of town and on their way in to make sure that they get here to vote. I know that um, the, citizen, the senior citizens, they like to come in. We did hear a lot of that, um, where they would like to come in to, to cast their votes. So with the kiosk, that gives them the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Bateman. I lied. <laughs> Last comment. So if we're saying it's a higher voter turnout, I guess for either the clerk's office or Brian, I, it's more of a comment. If you have a higher voter turnout, that's a good thing. I'm kind of shocked. You said Clarington, 21%. Shame on them. That, that's a disengaged community. So if we do get a higher turnout, all the more reason the system's going to have to make sure that it doesn't crash. Because if you get a higher turnout, and that's what the Simply Voting does, then that stands to the argument that the other councillor said that you're going to need multiple stations all over because you're going to have that many more people voting if that's what this system does. Right. I don't think there was a question there, so we're gonna just go over to Councillor LeBlanc. So, Mayor, uh, to the clerk. Uh, so right now your motion says there's only two kiosks, one here at the library, one at the library in Conduton. So, so let's say we go with this internet voting, right? So let's say Brighton by the Bay, they have a hall. Could you have a kiosk there? Could you have one if they have a hall in Presqu'ile so that the seniors can't come? And you're going to go to all the seniors places and have a kiosk so they can all vote the people that talk to me they say and some of them i asked the question some of them volunteered and got me in, in sobeys tonight i was buying my hamburger they said if they didn't get a ballot they weren't going to vote so that's shame on them okay all right that's why i look at it you, should, you have a right to vote and you should vote i vote all the time and i'm one of those those spouses, my wife never tells me how she votes, but she wants to know how I vote and I tell her, but she never tells me how she does. And I respect that. And everybody should do that. I respect that 100%. The, the thing is, is on this motion. So as it stands now, we have to defeat it to let you come back to tell us where you're gonna put the kiosks. No, no. The, the, the motion has nothing to do with the, the kiosks. It's just, we're receiving the report the report does note a couple of kiosks, but I think through this discussion, 
it's been made pretty clear that council would be wanting a broader use of kiosks uh, so that we can capture as many voters as we can during the election process. And if Madam Clerk, if I'm off base with that, now's the time to let us know. Deputy Clerk. Uh, through the mayor, uh, one of the benefits of this system is that it's fully scalable to any uh, number of kiosks that we want and that doesn't affect the cost whatsoever. Um, it's just a matter of us putting the uh, staff uh, person to set up the kiosk really. Right, I'm, I'm just conscious that once we get into the election, council will have no authority to um, advise the clerk's office where or what to do or, or be seen to be interfering in any way with the election. Well, so I think we wanna know yeah. that, the clerk, that the clerk's office is clear that this council wants broad use of kiosks in as many locations as is possible to capture as many electors as is possible. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Anderson. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I know um, when you're talking about it's not going to cost anymore. I, I have no problem if it's going to cost a little bit anyhow, but you're going to have you're going to have attendance at, at these kiosks assisting people, right? So there's going to be an increase in costs. Deputy Clerk. Through the mayor. Yeah, I, I meant in the system. Uh, <laughs> the, the system itself is scalable to any uh, level that um, council and, and staff require. So additional staff, that's on our side. But the system itself is fully scalable. Uh, I'll try to make this a question this time. So the number of kiosks, that'll be determined. Everybody said that they want multiple, but it's not just about how many. And I trust, and I'm not directing staff, that's Mr. Kasman's job to dispense people where they are, but it's safe to assume that the entire clerk's office is gonna be involved. My point is, and I'm not saying it because Tom is in the room, I've never met anybody that has the accessibility knowledge that Mr. Street has. So I trust that not just how many locations, because we can have as many as we want, if they can't access them, but I trust our expert will be there to make sure that not only is it where it's supposed to be, that people can get to it. So that's a safe assumption, I hope. Fair enough. Safe assumption? Yes, sir. Thank you. Councillor Tadman. Mayor, maybe could we uh, uh, call the vote on this because it's gonna almost be time for us to vote in the next election if we don't <laughs> get over this. That's <laughs> Offside comment, but very fair, actually. <laughs> Anyone further before I ask the clerk to call the vote? Madam Clerk, please call the vote. I will start with Councillor LeBlanc. No. Councillor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Laura Connect. Yes. Councillor Ron Anderson. Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman. Uh, based on what I've heard tonight, yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander. Yes. That's carried. Thank you. That takes us to our next report with regard to the Harbor Street sewage pumping station upgrades. Uh, Mr. Poole. We've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Uh, no, Your Worship. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Deputy Mayor Connect. The Council received the staff report regarding the Harbor Street um, SPS sewage pumping station upgrade contract award, and further that Council award the Harbor Street sewage pumping station upgrades contract PW 2021 19 to Strong Brothers General Contracting Limited in the amount of $2,338,390.69, including 20% contingencies, as well as the expense portion of the HST. Is there any discussion? Councillor Bateman. Uh, just a question around the pricing. I'm, my memory might not be perfect, but I thought that when this was put into the budget, wasn't it around the 970 or 975? And now we're up to the two and three. We're going to let Mr. Parkinson field that question. <clears throat> Through your worship. Uh, I don't remember the number discussed at that time. I believe it was 800,000 for the force main portion of this project. 
Uh, collectively, though, the two, we budgeted $3 million for the pumping station and the force meet. And what, what, is the, what is the total cost of that, pro that project now, if, if we were to pass this motion tonight? It's through your worship. It's uh, in the financial implications part of the report. Oh, thank you. Um, it'll be $3,013,592.60. So on a $3 million project, we're 13 six over budget, 13,600 over budget. Well, that's pretty close. But that's inclusive of the full 20% contingency right. too. Thank you. Councilor Rowley. Is this project going to uh, begin uh, ASAP then? Mr. Parkinson? Uh, through your worship, yes, uh, they'll start ordering parts right away and there'll be about a four month lead time on the pumps alone. So I'm not sure when they'll break ground, but they'll probably get the bulk of the uh, equipment and pieces in place before they'll break ground. Thank you, Councilor Tadman. I know very little about costs of such things. I haven't been doing any purchasing with the pumps for treatment plants and things like that. So I, I can only trust that this is what the cost is. But I know that at least the last council, and I think even before that, we've been talking about doing something about this pumping station. It's long overdue. So I think we really need to get on with it. Um, so uh, I don't remember exactly the amounts of money, but I believe that you have checked this out. So hopefully, um, when we've got, we, we had two, two different uh, tenders, right? And they came very close in the price. So um, let's, as far as I'm concerned, we've got to get at this. I, I for one, depend on my sewage treatment plant. So I, and a lot of other people in the urban area do. So I, we're long overdue getting this done. Thank you for that. Councilor LeBlanc. Well, there, there's another whole thing that we, but you're going to look after that, Councillor LeBlanc. <laughs> the, the question that I have for the uh, director is, are we getting a whole new um, lift station or are we just getting three pumps, electrical, and as was into the contract, moving the APU from inside to outside for $22 million, for, 20, uh, for $2,300,000? Three of worship. Uh, that's correct. The structure remains the same inside, but all the infrastructure and support equipment is completely changing and it'll be all new. Councilor LeBlanc. Fully known that our municipality is growing with more infrastructure, more residential, more things are coming, more industries coming, and depending which way they go. The pump sizes that you're using, the brake horsepower that you're using on. Uh, that's from horsepower, brake horsepower to the impeller. Uh, are you increasing the volume that can go through the, the capacity of it? Mr. Parkinson? Or are you still 25 horsepower? Three, worship. Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, I'll defer to Mr. Morcom. He's the project engineer with our consulting firm that looked after the design and tendering of this project. Is he here? He is with us. Oh, sorry, what's his name? Matthew. What's his last name? Morcom. Morcom, Mr. Morcom? Hello, um, through your worship, yes, um, they, we are increasing the capacity um, with the new force main um, and, and now having two force mains um, and three equally sized pumps, we do have additional capacity within the station now, yes. Thank you for that. Councilor LeBlanc as a follow-up. The question was, what was the brake horsepower that you're using? Uh, the current, the new horsepower is still 25 horsepower. The question is the brake horsepower. There's horsepower, brake horsepower transfers it to the impeller. Uh, my, I'm not sure I can answer that question off the top of my head. I'm... Okay. Is that something staff could look into and advise uh, Councillor LeBlanc and the rest of council just for our information, I guess? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate and, that. And the, the volume increase per pump. And the what? The volume increase per pump. And the volume increase per pump, please? Yes. Thank you for that. Councillor Bateman. I was just going to ask, I don't want to make this go longer, but if I get an email on brake horsepower and the other stuff, I really don't know what that means. So I don't either. I don't know it's if just, there's a quick it's answer just, on what brake horse, how, horsepower. It's part of our size. communications policy that all members of council would be <laughs> included in that. 
I think it would be important that we are just in case. <laughs> Councillor Anderson. Are those important questions to hold up this uh, I would say no. no, not at all. I would say no. Not at all. That's why we're going to get them offline. Uh, I'm 100% in support. Of it. There you go. So you hear, everyone heard that? <laughs> Councilor for Councilor Bateman, I'm 100% in support of this. Thank you for that. Let's call the vote. Anyone else? Yeah. Councilor Rowley. Thank you. Just one more thing. Um, as for who's paying for this, the taxpayers in the rural area of our municipality, this is no cost to them. This is a user pay situation, correct? That is how of, that is how our wastewater uh, that's right. is, is paid for. Just that's correct. Just yes. it's a it's a big number, and so those yeah. who uh, it's yeah. not a tax increase. No. Councillor Tadman and I, we will see that increase on our water sewer bill. And so will the deputy mayor. And Councillor so, Bateman. And Councillor Bateman and, and the deputy mayor. Or the deputy mayor, yes. Yeah. So those of us will be paying for that. Mr. Parkinson, you have a comment. Uh, through your worship. Uh, just to expand on Councillor Rowley's um, comments, a percentage of this is coming from development charges, which is uh, $245,000 will be funded by development charges. And those development charges will be raised from houses built in the urban area not houses built in the rural area. That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from members of council? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Next report is the parking control bylaw amendment. Mr. McGee, Mr. McGee online, no? Uh, Mr. Walsh, no, uh, well, it was reviewed by Mr. Parkinson. So Mr. Parkinson, <laughs> do you have anything to add or highlight? Not at this time. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Council Rowley. The Council receives a report dated October 18th, 2021, regarding a bylaw to amend and update the parking bylaw 126, 2016. And the Council authorizes the approval and execution of the amending parking bylaw as outlined in attachment number one, here attached here too. Is there any discussion? Councillor Bateman. Uh, just a quick question that is part of this, but ties into our previous discussion at the, the last council meeting, one before that, where the concern came up on Alice Street on vehicles parking where they shouldn't be. Are we, are we gonna be looking at the whole parking control bylaw for those? Because some of those streets already have no parking on them and other streets don't. And before tonight's council meeting, I received an email from somebody that lives in the area that we're addressing now that was talking about going down other streets where people are parked and it turns it into a one lane. And they were talking about Raglan Street and another street. It's always the, in the winter time, it's the snow blowing people and the summertime is the grass cutting. Will that be coming separate to address those things? Mr. Parkinson? That might be a question for Mr. Walsh. If there's any bylaw changes coming to the parking, but I'm not aware of any. Mr. Walsh? We can see that your lips are moving, Paul, and we can see that you're not muted, but we still can't hear you. No, uh, he's not muted, but he may be having technological issues. Can you hear me now? I can, thank you. Yeah, so um, I'll be uh, referring that to the law enforcement officer and, and doing a follow-up to him. So we'll, we'll hear back from staff on that issue. Uh, that's correct, Mayor. Thank you, appreciate that. Any further questions or comments from members of council? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Our next report is with regard to the COVID-19 vaccination pol policy. Madam Clerk, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Again. Actually, if it can go through the CAO. Mr. Castleman. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this report was uh, brought before council for their consideration on October 4th. There were a few questions that uh, arose out of that discussion. And uh, we are bringing back a, an amended report for your consideration. Uh, certainly, I've had an opportunity over the course of the last week or so to sit down with uh, Councillor Bateman uh, and try and address the uh, various questions that he uh, raised during the October 4th get together. So you're seeing this evening uh, a mandatory vaccination policy uh, um, that uh, the dates have changed somewhat 
uh, we originally had October 30th for a compliance date. It is now November 30th because we've delayed a couple of weeks. And I think that probably getting the communi effective communication out to the staff and committee members and council members and giving them adequate time to get their vaccination and uh, uh, notice back to the municipality so that we can react according is probably appropriate. There are certainly costs, or there are certainly questions associated with cost of vaccination. There are none for uh, uh, the quick the quick costs. Uh, there's a couple of different ways of doing vaccinations. Uh, uh, certainly, there's the, the quick method and self-administered method of, of of vaccinations, and there's no cost associated with that. Uh, and there's uh, sorry, Mr. Councilman, you're saying vaccinations, but you actually mean the, the tests, the right? Tests. Yes, sorry, thank you. The tests, that's right. Uh, and secondly, there's a more uh, uh, robust uh, test that uh, requires uh, the assistance of a, a, a practitioner. Uh, and there may be some costs associated with that. Having said that, um, our intention is to pass those costs on to those uh, who are unvaccinated and and uh, believe they wanna to continue to be unvaccinated. Um, if there is a, a, a situation where uh, the municipality wants to consider um, paying for those costs, I'll make that determination. And uh, we have a COVID fund as, you, as you're uh, all aware, we've received uh, funding through the province to assist us in uh, relating to various uh, uh, measures of this nature. So fairly straightforward, uh, uh, I'm in regular contact with medical officer health regular contact with my counterparts across uh, uh, Northumberland County. We're all bringing forward a uh, mandatory vaccination policy. Uh, it's in various stages in different municipalities. Uh, I think Port Hope is, is uh, um, uh, giving some thoughts, further thoughts with respect to whether they're gonna go ahead or not. So I don't wanna mislead you. Certainly all the other municipalities are moving forward with vaccination policy. So uh, I'm a strong believer in it. Uh, and uh, our medical officer uh, is a strong believer. And uh, I believe we're moving forward in the right direction uh, with respect to ensuring that um, we make our workplace as uh, safe as possible. Thank you for that. And with that, the motion is moved by Councillor Anderson, second by Councillor Bateman, that council receive the staff report COVID-19 vaccination policy and the staff be directed to implement a COVID-19 vaccination policy setting out vaccine requirements. Is there any discussion? Councillor Bateman. Uh, I, first, I wanna thank uh, the CAO for calling me and asked me to meet. And most, if not all of my questions, put my mind at ease on uh, how we were gonna do it. And I agree with them. I'm a strong believer in that every, every place of business should have one. And I like the approach in, and in a nutshell, this is not a, hard line like some places have done there is an option for those that make the personal choice not to get vaccinated that they can still continue to work and it's with you know the weekly testing that's in there and that was one of the things we didn't spell out but you assured me that it's weekly testing because i know there's some municipalities have done it the, you know public service has done it where it's a hard line that you either get vaccinated or you're unemployed i kind of like this approach because i still believe it's a personal choice to get vaccinated but with every choice there's different things. The one thing I was going to ask uh, the CIO, if I could, like the mandatory education session, I think is a great idea. Would that be also open to those that are vaccinated? Because it, you indicated there's no cost. I believe when we talked, you said it's an online training. I think if it's an online training, that would be a great module to roll out to every staff member that they could do on their own time and even members of council if they wish to do it. Mr. Councilman? Here, you, Mr. Mayor. The, the, the quick answer is absolutely. Uh, we can make it available to um, staff members vaccinated or not, uh, including council members and uh, uh, members of our committees that uh, may find it helpful, quite frankly. Thank you for that, Councilor Bateman. And the only reason I suggested council as well is because we're part of this policy because it spells out that council members fall into this. 100%, thank you for that. Deputy Mayor Connect. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering if there's a time uh, when uh, we no longer need to have this policy um, in the future. Um, what kind of parameters are, are around that? Uh, you may not be able to, I think you you're understand, <laughs> do you understand what I'm asking? Mr. Castleman? Uh, to you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, boy, it's a moving target. And uh, we've been dealing with uh, COVID 
far longer than what we would have anticipated uh, starting back in March of last year. So uh, in due course, uh, uh, we have to change on the fly and uh, in due course, uh, we'll be moving away from the various policies and directives that we have in place uh, dealing with COVID. Uh, quite frankly, from my perspective, the sooner the better. But uh, for now, we're, we, uh, it's incumbent upon us to do our best to make sure our uh, employment, uh, place of employment is a safe place. Thank you for that, Councillor Rowley. I'm just going to listen to a little bit more of the conversation. I think I've had Councillor Bateman answered a couple of the concerns that I had. Thank you. Any further discussion from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. And that takes us into notices of motions and motions. And the only one before us is the one that was read as a notice on September 20th. It's moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. Whereas the municipality of Brighton continues to grow in size along with increased tourism, the municipality has been experiencing an increase in traffic volume, and along with this, an increase in speeding throughout the municipality. And whereas typically the conversation revolves around increased policing or lowering street speed maximums as methods to deal with speeding issues, this motion is for Brighton Council to request and authorize staff to bring back a report for consideration during budget deliberations on alternative or additional measures beyond increased policing and dropping speed limit maximums to help deal with the issue of speeding on our municipal streets that outlines the cost to implement identified new measures along with projected effectiveness of measures selected for consideration, uh, i.e. mobile speed cameras, photo radar, additional stop signs in identified areas, trouble areas, speed bumps, rumble strips, etc. cetera. Uh, Councilor Bateman, this is your motion. Would you like to speak to it? I don't think it's any secret for anybody sitting in this room or anybody that may be listening at home that we've all heard it that there's speeding issues within the town and not just speeding issues with the program that Councillor Anderson mentioned about uh, the awareness. There's going through the stop sign issues. It's not everybody, but it's, it's there. And as the municipality grows, it becomes more of it because there's just more people living here. As an example, I think we were all emailed tonight, if I'm not mistaken, we were on the email from the residents on Cedar Street, which has come up before. And if we look at the traditional method, we always have the people, oh, not all people, but we should lower the speed limit. But if we lower the speed limit from Cedar Street from 50 to 40, that doesn't mean they're gonna do 40, that just means they're gonna be doing 60 and a 40 instead of 60 and a 50. So I just think, you know, it's not we're coming to a decision tonight, but staff can bring back alternatives. Cause I think there has to be another way of just throwing money at more police officers, which is not a bad thing because they do more than just catch speeders, but that's not by itself gonna stop the problems what we're seeing. Thank you for your comments. Uh, any discussion? Councillor Anderson. Only one thing about the uh, enforcement officers, uh, they, they can do a lot of education too. It's not about, you give a ticket to the worst, the worst drivers, but uh, when they have their attention at the side of the road, it's, it's about education and trying to put the fear of driving in them. And uh, so extra officers on the road can do a lot of good in a, in a lot of areas when you need them. But that's one thing that they can do is be out there. Uh, show, and I've heard it before. Well, our presence is enough. It'll slow them down. Well, you know it yourself. You follow the cars. They take off like crazy once they get around the corner. So it happens on the 401 too. If they see an officer, boom, they put the foot to the pedal a, a half a mile down the road. So... Uh, Anyhow, I'm still a strong believer in enforcement or, or an enforcement education. And uh, uh, the money should perhaps go there. I've been doing some, a little bit of studying myself on what's going on in other communities. Uh, and a lot of them are looking at reducing uh, right across. And I mentioned this before too, but looking at right across the board within the community of setting a, I'll just pick a number here for sake of 40, right through the whole community. Um, Sarnia is doing that this week. They're looking at that. Uh, they talk about speed bumps. There's a lot of problems with speed bumps, but they are effective in, in the right areas. Um, I'm not opposed to them uh, totally, but 
So I'm just touching on, this is really good. This, and I'll support this uh, motion because we need to really zero it down and quit talking about it and start getting some things done on it. But I'll strongly keep on pushing for a little more enforcement. And I've seen some improvement lately. I think we all have, but um, I think we have a way to go. And I know there's X number of officers assigned to, uh, let's just say urban, um, uh, Brighton, uh, I'm not talking the 401. Apparently we have a large detachment, but a lot of it isn't all geared to our, strictly our, our costs and our community. So I'd like to review that again. And uh, I heard some good comments from the mayor after his meeting with, uh, the inspector and the, the inspector, police services yes. board chair, yes. And uh, so that's favorable. So if we can pursue that discussion you had uh, along the lines, but yeah, let's bring this to budget and see what other other things are appropriate for our community. And, and the simplest is the best, I think. Thank you for that, Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think we touched on this last week. We had uh, correspondence in our uh, council package from a resident, um, the same thing. And I know we talked about then about um, kind of asking staff to bring us back a traffic calming report at some point. So I'm sure this will go along with that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council Bateman. Uh, just a, a quick clarification. I don't disagree with Councilman Anderson. At, our municipality is growing like from when I moved here. So you're always gonna have to look at increasing your police presence, not just for enforcement, police presence can be the deterrent so that you don't have to have any enforcement. But we also have to look at other methods because just because you have increased police presence, it will not necessarily stop the speeding and the running of the stop sign and stuff. Because most of the cities that you mentioned, they've all gone to red light cameras and mobile photo radars to help in addition, because there's not one silver bullet to solve this type of stuff. So I agree, we do need more police presence and that'll be something that we'll debate during budget deliberations. But we also have to look at other methods. And just for uh, <clears throat> staff's information, I know the county is uh, doing a, w I guess they're waiting on information from the city of Toronto on mobile photo radar <clears throat> to see how uh, um, it might be used across Northumberland County uh, from a county perspective. So if, if staff is looking to uh, seek information, there may be a, a resource there. And I also know the county did some traffic calming um, north of Coburg or north of Port Hope. I can't remember which in one of the hamlets uh, through one of the county roads with some success. So we may wanna look at what they've done there as well, just, uh, just by way of information. Uh, Mr. Parkinson, do you have a comment? Do you, did you have a comment? Oh, well, um, I guess just to advise council, uh, I don't know if staff even planning and, and public works working together could put together a plan or a solid report with, with factual information in it before budget starts, because we're already there. So my suggestion would be that we put into the budget uh, four of the digital speed signs that are portable so that we could disperse them through the uh, municipality. And then, because the ones we have on uh, Young Street are, are, they're big, heavy, and really awkward to move. So I'm thinking maybe if we put in the budget for four smaller ones that are a little more portable and solar powered, uh, that might go a long way because then we could hit these target areas and then make people aware of what, how, you know, the speed that they're actually doing. And would those, those uh, would those record speeds like our black cats do, or would they just be flashing? They, they can. You can get simplistic ones that just flash uh, speed, or you can get more expensive ones that record data. I don't know if we necessarily need to record the data in these incidents because we do have the black cats that we can uh, deploy through the municipality. Councillor Anderson. Um, I also was reading today that London was looking at the photo radar and it, the government, the uh, province has made it the responsibility of the municipalities to administer the costs, buy them, operate them, maintain them, and administrate all the fines. So the cost of us to do all that for the bottom line on it, something we should buy, look at another community and not waste a lot of time. Oh, if that's the case, a, a municipality of this size, it probably isn't, wouldn't be very effective unless you have a large number of well, well, probably a good reason to, to partner with the county yeah. because they have a, a, a larger bylaw enforcement department. They have, um, they're looking at a, a, an in, in, 
in-house solicitor and and uh, paralegal yeah. so they, they can uh, take these fines to court and so on or so, northumberland county i don't even know what we're do doing in the county on that right uh, so i think that's um it would be good for staff to reach yeah. out and provide that information to yeah. uh the council okay anything else council rowley thank you based on the comments from uh director of public works do we need to excuse me add that into the motion that um to uh maybe add some cost or for for them to research costs for budget um this motion does say to bring it forward to budget so okay. if that's what staff is able to bring forward to budget i would suggest that this year that is what council can anticipate okay. seeing um, understanding that if we pass this motion council will be looking for something a little more robust in future years <clears throat> understanding it might be a whole new group of people around the table next budget okay. season so so in that case could you just reread the motion please because yep. i obviously missed the budget you okay if i just read the second paragraph yes i'm okay with you just reading the second paragraph thank, thank you. you and whereas typically the conversation revolves around increased policing or lowering street speed maximums as methods to deal with the speeding issues this motion is for brighton council to request and authorize staff to bring back a report for consideration during budget deliberations on alternative additional measures beyond increased policing and dropping speed limit maximums to help deal with the issue of speeding on our municipal streets that outlines the cost to implement identified new measures along with projected effectiveness of measures selected for consideration, i.e. mobile speed cameras, photo radar, additional stop signs in identified troubled areas, speed bumps, rumble strips, et cetera. You're welcome. Anything further from members of council? Councillor Bateman. If I could just quickly add, those things that I listed, I'm not asking staff to bring back a cost for each one of those, the et cetera, whatever they bring back and the director brought that other suggestion, I'm perfectly fine with that. That's These are just ideas. To bring back, yeah. Whatever they bring right. back. Got it. Thank you. Councillor LeBlanc. I don't know, could I have a recorded vote? You, you sure can. Any other comments or questions from members of council? Madam Clerk, a recorded vote has been requested by Councillor LeBlanc. Councillor Doug LeBlanc? Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley? Yes. Councillor Mary Tadman? Yes. Yes. Councillor Ron Anderson? Yes. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander? Yes. And that's carried. Thank you. There's no unfinished business listed on this agenda, which takes us into bylaws. Our first bylaw is with regard to alternative voting methods 2022 election. And it's moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to authorize the use of internet voting as an alternative method of voting for the 2022 school board and municipal election. Is there any further comment? Those in favor? Any opposed? The motion is carried. Next bylaw is an agreement with Strong Brothers General Contracting with regard to the Harbor Street sewage pumping station upgrades. It's moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Council LeBlanc. The Council gives a bylaw. It's for second and third reading and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute an agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton and Strong Brothers General Contracting Limited for the Harbor Street sewage pumping station upgrades. Any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. The next bylaw is the parking control bylaw. It's moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc. The council gives a bylaw. It's for second and third reading and finally passes on the state. Being a bylaw to amend and update bylaw 126 2016, the bylaw to regulate and control vehicular parking in the municipality of Brighton. Any further discussion on this item? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. We have no reports of advisory committees of council, reports, minutes, and council reports. We have no reports of minutes of statutory committees, boards, and external agencies. We have no correspondence, direction items, endorsements, communications, or petitions. The only item under FYI correspondence is the Northumberland County updates October 12 to 2022 with a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. The council received the Northumberland County updates October 12 to 2022, 2022. 
it says 2021, but it's 2022 as information. Is there any discussion? Councilor Bateman. I bring it up every time you do this, probably for the director. Have you heard back regarding the pre-design for Prince Edward Street when we talked about the possible expansion? Because I think you said it's 2023, but they might do it. You'd like to see it done in 2022. Mr. Castleman. That's you, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm going to field that question, uh, and uh, I've not had a chance to talk to uh, Mr. Berkinson yet. Uh, uh, we are meeting uh, on Thursday with uh, the county to talk about just that, uh, along with a number of other issues that have been brought up from, through council over the course of the last number of months. So maybe you'll have an answer the next time you ask. <laughs> Any further discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? Motion's carried. Brings us to question period. Madam Clerk, Deputy Clerk, are you aware of anyone joining us for question period this evening? Mr. Street. I will read the motion to proceed in camera. If, uh, if the motion is passed, we will take a 10 minute recess and we will end the YouTube live stream. It's a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Anderson, that council resolve itself into closed session October 18th, 2021 at 8, 10 p.m. Pursuant to the Ontario Municipal Act 2001 as amended subsection 239 2B, personal matters about an identifiable individual including municipal and local board employees um, we're not dealing with the appointment, right? Yeah. Uh, specifically, the organizational review. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Thank you, everyone who has joined us by YouTube, and uh, we will take a 10 minute recess before engaging in the closed session.